Hello, book nerds of the interwebs. My name is Alana, and this is my little corner of booktube in which I geek out about books and other book people geek out about books with me and we have a good time. So if that sounds like a good time for you or to you, you can go ahead on and let's get this out of the way now. Feel free to subscribe and stick around because I like to do good old one book, re one book book reviews videos. That was not good English, but you know what I'm saying. I like to just sit down in one video and talk about one book in detail. So that's what we do on this channel. And I've already spoiled it. Well, the title spoiled it, but here I am. Catch 22 by Joseph Heller. Ah, kind of an intimidating book to review because there's so much to unpack here. So let's jump into it. As you know, I like to start with a quote. I use a lot of quotes in my book reviews if you are new here because I consider them receipts, backing up what I'm saying so you know I'm not pulling this out of thin air. <laughs> but who's fighting for the decent folk? Who's fighting for more votes for the decent folk? There's no patriotism, that's what it is, and no matriotism either. So Catch-22 by Joseph, Joseph Heller, a well-known American classic. And I buddy read this with my friend Rebecca and we buddy read books throughout the whole year. We finish one, then we start one, finish one, then we start one. And we will spend a, sometimes two to four months just on one text. And so this was one that took us, uh, about, I would say, two to three months because, again, a lot to unpack here. And when we first started reading this book, we weren't really, excuse me, I burped. Ooh, I'm in a food coma. Like I'm in a food coma sidebar. I am in such a food coma that I have a headache. <laughs> like I'm feeling it behind the eyes. After this, I might have to take a painkiller. Um, yeah. Anyway, but we were kind of unsure what to think about this book as we were reading it. But then there's a point in the book, I would say after the first two thirds, which is a lot, I know, to kind of get through before something really starts to, you kind of start to really like it for us anyway in the last one third of the book. And that's when our opinion of this book started to change. But that's not saying that this was not still frustrating narrative, mainly because of the writing choices that are the style in which he decided to, Heller decided to construct this novel, not so much the themes at all. Actually, we were gung ho over the themes. So Catch-22 is set during the last six months of World War II and an American bombardier squadron is in Italy. And our main character, Rosarian, is angry that people are trying to kill him. At first, Rebecca and I were not impressed with this argument, like, or his, his point of view. Like, yeah, my guy, you're in a war. People gonna try to kill you, you know, but, <laughs> but as you continue to read this book, you kind of start to realize who is he really arguing is trying to kill him? It's easy to assume that the opposing side, the Axis power soldiers, are the one that he's complaining, are the ones that he's complaining are trying to kill him. But really what he means is, or he's implying that he's also concerned that his own side is trying to kill him. This book really explores corruption within entities such as the government slash the military and what it means to be a free individual when your country is trying to use you as a pawn for its own gain. It also didn't take as many pages into this book to for us to be heavily reminded of crime and punishment. Rebecca and I buddy read crime and punishment last year, sometime last year. Ooh, I think it was in the latter part of last year. And the similarities are so glaring that it is obvious that Heller heavily pulled from Crime and Punishment as an influence for this work. If we hadn't run, read Crime and Punishment before reading this, I think some of it would have been, we would have missed some of it. Um, I, I actually think that reading Crime and Punishment first and then reading Crime and Punishment, sorry, duh, reading Crime and Punishment first and then reading Catch-22 could be a good strategy. They're really good companion reads or reading them at the same time if you are a person that likes to read or have multiple narratives going one at a time in order to really get the full scope of what Heller is arguing here. Because the I, the concept of insanity and craziness is central to this narrative as it is central in Crime and Punishment. 
And here's a quote from Crime and Punishment. His basic idea is that there is no specific disorder in a mad person's organism, but what, but that madness is, so to speak, a logical error of judgment, a mistaken view of things. And so in Catch-22, Joseph Heller references Raskolnikov quite a bit, which is the main character in Crime and Punishment. You think everybody is Jehovah. You're no better than Raskolnikov, who felt he could justify killing an old woman. So again, like I said, in Catch-22, this concept of craziness and insanity and who is crazy and who isn't crazy is central to this narrative, as it is in Crime and Punishment. In Crime and Punishment, that is a tongue twister, Raskolnikov murders an old woman, not a spoiler, and he then, and he feels he is completely justified to do so, but he's still going against what is acceptable in society. Murdering people is not okay. After he commits this murder, he spirals downward into this pit of craziness for, for in, in, in layman's terms. And so Yozarian also holds views that are contrary to what's socially acceptable, especially for him as a soldier. And so both books are making the argument that when an individual goes beyond societal norms and starts to rationalize and reason in a different way, those are the people that typically start to challenge society's um, structures and power systems or moral codes or eth ethic code, ethical codes. And these, both of these characters are considered to be crazy in their own way. And how does society, governments, mil the, in, the authoritarian entities, anybody in power, whoever is able to control the narrative, who do they determine or who do they consider to be the, those in society who are crazy? Oftentimes, it's those that have different viewpoints. And so the way that society handles these people is by ostracizing them. They begin to gaslight them because they have the resources to do so. They have more resources and su stru supporting structures behind them to completely discredit this person. And sometimes just to discredit them so much that the person themselves starts to have misgivings about what it is that they initially thought. You see what I'm saying? That's what gaslighting is. So if it's like somebody's like, oh, um, I just turned the, the temperature up in the house. Why is it back down at 75 when I put it at 77? Um, they're like, no, you didn't know that never happened. And if you repeat something, you know, enough, the person will start to, their own reality starts to get skewed. So many monstrous events were occurring that he no, was no longer positive which events were monstrous and which were really taking place. This happens to several other characters in Catch-22, not just Yozarian, where once these people start to pose a problem, they start asking the wrong questions, you know? <laughs> um, those questions that start to dig a little deeper and would make some stuff come to light, they start to have mind games played with them by their superiors. There is a lot of repetitive speech and dialogue in this novel. And at times, yes, it can be annoying, which is again why I felt like some of the writing choices that Heller made were a little bit frustrating, but I know why he did it. They are repeating the same words and phrases back to each other. Like, are you crazy? You're not crazy. Man, you're crazy. You're crazy. And it goes back and forth, sometimes for like a page at a time. And it's showing that again, when you repeat something often enough, people will begin to leave to believe it, even if it's false. And I, I'm reading my, uh, I have my written review here posted up and I said, ah, oh, there's nothing like being gas or there's nothing like being in an abusive relationship with your government. Yeah. So this segues nicely because there is another central theme in this novel. And that is the concept of blind loyalty and trust in authority. We will never be able to convince anyone we're superior without our uniforms. Sooner or later, we'll get our uniforms back and then we'll be their superiors again. Heller is showing how uh, entities of power like the government, like the military, 
or have the resources to decorate themselves and those working on their behalf in order to gain the trust of the masses because they know how to look the part. It is easy to follow people who look the part regardless of how shady they may actually be. It is easier to follow attractive people, whether people like to hear that or not, it is true. When people are attractive, they are easier to follow because people are enamored by beauty. Be like, oh, shiny thing over there, I want it. You know what I mean? It is easy to follow something that looks wealthy, that looks like it knows what it's doing. Um, when a lot of times it's just a facade. Um, but again, people are easily blinded by things like that. The important thing is to keep them pledging, he explained to his cohorts. It doesn't matter whether they meet it or not. That's why they make kids pledge allegiance even before they know what pledge and allegiance means. Again, this is another quote here that's just a gold mine. So many good quotes in this book, which is why it's annotated the way that it is. Um, authorities also know how to manipulate through brainwashing. So it's very early on in the novel, Heller highlights um, that the true backbone of America and what makes this country so great is are its everyday people. He's really using this to contrast blind patriotism to hard working grassroots patriotism. The people who keep society running at the, you know, these are your, your blue collar workers, your, you know, it's it, in some ways it's quite cliche, you know, your white picket fences and your football games and your apple pie, your everyday people who just want to go through life minding their business. I'm currently reading, Rebecca and I are actually currently reading Grapes of Wrath and John Steinbeck is making this argument as well it's your everyday people who keep the country going and the, and they're the ones who just want to make they just want to live their life and they don't want to be bothered they just want to you know be able to meet their needs and meet the needs of that of their family and have all of these big entities stay out of their business and stop controlling their life that's what they're saying makes people in this country so great and you could argue that really for any country it's your average person who's really uh, the backbone of a society versus this contrived and blind patriotism generated by authorities to manipulate the people to do what they want them to do. And so this book talks a lot about government in particular and the military and how they are both quite corrupt and they're really, they, they work their own, the military as part of the government. So they can prepare as many official reports as they want and choose whichever ones they need on any a given on any given occasion. They can get all the witnesses they need simply by persuading them that destroying you is for the good of the country. So Catch 22 from there, Catch 22 is asking and presenting the answer to how you deal with a corrupt system that is actually corrupt at all levels. You come to come, you come, uh, you get acquainted with some characters in this book that are working with the system within the system and their dealings are shady. So you've got your one person, but then you've got this overarching umbrella of corruption and how it's quite layered. And so this is how he answers it. Heller is arguing that in order to resist this, there has to be a point in which the freedom of the individual and what makes the individual uniquely autonomous, that has to be preserved. When the state is in a state of decay, the individual has to fight back against that system to restore it through individuality. Definitely, I mean, it doesn't get... Does a theme get more American than that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when I say that the themes in this are very pro freedom, pro individualism, pro my rights, this is one of those narratives. It's very, it's definitely your classic American novel. Um, but I think that this is a question that societies will always ask themselves. The Greeks, at ancient Greeks, asked themselves this question. The ancient Romans asked this question. I don't think that. Um, I don't care where you are on the planet, you know, this question of how much autonomy does an individual really have? How much right does the state have to impose on that individuality 
where are the lines drawn? And also when you're in a state of crisis, for example, like in this book, War, those boundaries become gray. And again, where does the where does the right of the individual stop and end when the government is relying on its populace to be its hands and feet in the middle of crisis? History proves that once you give up your freedoms, it is harder to get them back because what state is going to want to give back freedoms when it makes them more powerful? Um, and usually in order to get them back, the people have to fight back. There's just usually, it has to get pretty ugly in order to get those rights back. And I've got some really good quotes here about that from this book. Someone had to do something sometime. Every victim was the culprit, every culprit a victim, and somebody had to stand up sometime to break the lousy chain of inherited habit that was imperiling them all. It was not fair for Yuzarian to only think to think only of his own safety. The country was in peril. He was jeopardizing his traditional rights of freedom and independence by exercising exercising them. Don't talk to me about fighting to save my own country. I've been fighting all along to save my country. Now I'm going to fight a little to save myself. The country is not in danger anymore, but I am. I think those quotes are fantastic. You don't really need to expound on them a whole lot. They speak for themselves. And again, they ask these questions that are as old as time as where does individual an individual's autonomy and freedom begin and end? And um, what does it mean when an individual truly belongs to the state? And as a person who was a history major who studied uh, some pretty gruesome regimes when in authoritarian forms of government in which people, the people don't have much of any, much really much autonomy at all. They belong to the state during various types of government structures or, you know, uh, political structures. It's quite scary. <laughs> um, so yeah, these are questions that people are always asking. Lastly, I'm going to circle back to Zuzarian's main concern in this novel, which was his concern over being killed, right? And Rebecca and I kind of mused over this a bit. We were like, okay, why is he so concerned about this? And this is what we came up with. Death is inevitable. But this book does ask, does the, again, it goes back to individual rights and individual autonomy. Does the individual have a right to determine how they die? And what does it mean to have autonomy in death? These are men at war. So the probability probability of them having a violent death is high, especially for such young men. I think the youngest character that's mentioned in this book is in his teens. Um, and so Yuzarian is really resisting dying in this way. He wants to die in his own, of his own volition. He doesn't want his life taken, taken from him in this way, especially when he is working within a corrupt system and he they, they just want to use him. And he's like, well, no, I don't want to be a part of this. There are other uh, characters that I kind of face with this internal crisis as well, uh, because for every man that lives, there is going to be somebody that has to die, especially in an environment like war. To pray for their safety was to pray for the death of, uh, of other young men he did not even know. It was too late to pray, yet that was all he knew how to do. So yeah, Catch-22. This is a book that, again, like I said, we found frustrating at times. It is quite repetitive. Each chapter is titled with a different character uh, with a different character's name, and there's something on my eye. Um, and so you're getting their point of view, and sometimes you may get different, even though it's written in third person. It focuses on that that one character predominantly within that chapter and then you also so a lot of the events that you're already acquainted with they're repeat they're uh, repeated and you're like we know my guy we know again a lot of repetitive dialogue I know why he used the repetitive dialogue because he's going back to this concept of craziness and being gaslit I don't know if gaslit was even a term when this book was gaslighting was a term when this book was published in 1962 I'm not sure but that's the that's how what we would call it now 
so yeah this book is long it's over 500 pages and I do think and so there were times when this book felt like a slog but I do think that and we did Rebecca and I did think that even if this was a 300 to 350 page book it what the themes would have been just as impactful but again because the themes are so rich and because it asks it makes you ask these really interesting questions it was worth it even though it was a little frustrating um because these are questions that societies have been grappling with are grappling with and will continue to grapple with and so in that way we we thought that it was a worthwhile read and it was it's it was nice to get this classic american piece of literature checked off our reading list because I think it deserves a spot on the shelf right next to 1984 and Fahrenheit 451. And it does have a sequel titled Something Happened. And mm. so I may eventually read it. Um, the picture of it here is on the back. Something Happened. Has anybody read Something Happened? If you did, please let me know and how you felt about it or if, if it's even worth the read. <laughs> but um, I will definitely, in hindsight, even though while I was reading it, I was quite frustrated again with how long it, it felt and this is a person who likes I'm a person who likes long books but again I felt like it could be shortened but because there's just so much to discuss and to dive into and I know there's still some stuff I missed I will eventually probably uh, reread this book again at some point um so yeah that is my review of Catch-22 have you read Catch-22 it just fell did you enjoy it um did you pick up on some of the same things and questions that Rebecca and I uh, kind of decided to hone in on. And what, if you've read it, what else did you pick up on that we may have missed or decided not to focus on? After uh, this review, do you plan to read it or was it already on your TBR? You're like, yeah, no, I'm not just interested. Let me know. Um, yeah, I'm gonna wrap this up. And I already said that this is repetitive. If you liked this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave me a comment. If you would like to see what other shenanigans I get up to on the interwebs, please feel free to follow me on Instagram because I enjoy Instagram. It is tons of fun. The bookish community over there is, again, they're good people. And I like to um, post about a funny meme a day and dog videos and all that good stuff on, on the interwebs. So yeah, I'm going to sign out. Because again, I'm in a food coma. My goodness, I'm feeling it behind the eyes. And now I got something on my contact lenses. So I'm going to wrap this up. Bye. <laughs>